Good morning, everyone. And if you would please stand with us for our very first song. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow for now indeed i find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Jesus paid it all all to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Let's sing this together. Oh, praise the one. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Amen. I 
I am weary from the waves crashing over every day. God of mercy, please come rescue me. I am longing for your voice, your gentle whisper in the noise. Father, tell me everything's all right. Your power, your presence, it breaks strongholds, King of heaven, when you speak, mountains move, I believe there will be breakthrough. alone can take my scars piece by piece restore my heart take what's broken make it whole again let's believe this your power your power your presence Break strongholds, the King of heaven, when you speak, the mountains move, I believe there will be breakthrough. Whoa. There will be breakthrough. Shake the mountains. Shake the mountains. Break the walls apart. Open the heavens. Almighty God, overcome. Defender of mine. Whoa, by your power. Oceans open wide, your fire falls down, heaven and earth collide. King Jesus, forever by my side, yeah. Shake the mountains, break the walls apart, open the heavens, almighty God. Overcome, defender of my heart. By your power, by your power, oceans open wide, your fire falls down, heaven and earth collide. King Jesus, forever by my side. Yeah.
Don't we serve a powerful and mighty God that even in our lowest moments, he is there? Can I get an amen on that? I know he has been there in my life in those kinds of moments, and I've been able to lean on him, and I hope that you have that same kind of testimony where you can sing that kind of song and believe it firmly in your heart. So good morning and welcome to Crossroads Church of Dunwoody. My name is Aaron, and I serve on the finance team here. We are so glad that you guys have joined us for service this morning. If you are a first-time guest with us, we want to extend a special welcome to you. Uh, we do have a reception after service this morning uh, for you guys where you can meet the pastor and some of the staff and the elders and get to know a little bit more about Crossroads and we can get to know a little more about you. Um, we do have a, a website that you can fill out some guest information. I knew it and I promise I know it now, but you're probably going to have to help me. Guest.gift. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you can always um, find that information out there, and you can fill out a paper, or you can fill it out online, and we would love to know how you heard about Crossroads. Uh, you should have received a program when you came in this morning. Uh, it's a great place to take some sermon notes on the back or write down any inspirational thoughts that you had during the service today. Um, but on the front of it, it also has some really important information about upcoming events that we've got going on here at Crossroads, and then on the back also at the bottom are some important links for you guys, so make sure to check that information out. Uh, after the service today, um, uh, one of the things I want to point out is our growth groups. Uh, they have moved to after the service, so those start at 11 a.m. We've got some groups going through First and Second Timothy and Titus. The group that I'm in is doing a character study on Elijah. It's really awesome. We've had a really good time so far, um, so we invite you guys to join us for that. There's also one that meets in the lobby after the service that uh, is a sermon-based discussion. So we invite you guys to join a growth group. It's a fantastic opportunity to fellowship with other believers and continue to learn more about who God is and who you are in relation to him. So with that, I'm going to, I'll ask you guys to pray with me and we'll continue with our service. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that we have outside today that we can come together and worship you. We thank you for this time that we have to, to be together as a local body of Christ, to come together and just to praise your name and to say back to you what we believe about who you are, Father. We ask that you will be with us in this service today. We ask that you will open our ears and our hearts and our minds to hear what it is that you have to say to us this morning. It's in your son's name we ask these things. Amen. If you please rise for our next song. in your 
Let's just think about these words. You know, it's so precious just to be in his presence. And so often we come with our own agendas, with our own thoughts, with whatever we want. Um, but to say, God, I just want to be here in your presence with you. If we've seen that one last time together. Caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. Caught up in this holy moment, I never want to leave. Well, I'm not here for blessings. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything, and more than anything. just want you. Amen. Everyone can have a seat. Let's stand. $7.6 billion. Now that's a big number. That's how many people there are on earth. In the U.S. alone, estimates say that out of 328 million, there are nearly 246 million lost souls, men, women, boys, and girls that don't know Jesus. Those numbers seem big, but what if we were to focus on the number one? The Bible tells us that heaven rejoices every time one person comes to know Jesus. What if we were to focus on the daily conversations, those everyday meaningful interactions for Christ that can truly make an eternal difference in someone's life? We can reach our nation with the gospel. We can reach the millions. We can reach our friends and family and neighbors by starting with one. Who's your one? Who's your one?
It's been a theme for this month and certainly a uh, desire of our hearts to have that continual. And I think uh, something must be happening because I've heard some testimonies of uh, some answered prayers already, which is good as you're having uh, impact and uh, influence in some people's lives. Uh, also know that anytime we have an advance uh, for the kingdom, uh, Satan likes to attack and come after you know, let me just read you a verse, and I want to give you a little context. Uh, it has nothing to do with my message, but it certainly has something to do with the, the, the atmosphere of what's happening uh, in our church. We need to put on the full armor of God, it says in Ephesians chapter 6, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places so there are things that will come against believers when they're trying to advance the cause of Christ you know and, and certainly we've had some challenges in our church body over this last few months and financially a lot of that you know we've had some roofs being replaced we've had uh, uh, things take place that just out of the ordinary uh, we put in a brand new bathroom which was good for the upstairs of the Hope building and then found out that the pressure of the water uh, is not sufficient and we're not sure quite what to do about that we have gas lines that are connected to the uh, the chapel that uh, go underneath our playground all the way to this building and found out that they have a major leak and we're going to have to replace them. Not sure what the extent of that would be, but uh, that's kind of a, an unexpected uh, catastrophe in many ways, uh, digging up a lot of that uh, usable uh, space. And then this past week, our church was attacked, cyber attacked, with ransomware. Anybody know what ransomware is? If you can just guess what ransom is, uh, where all of our, our server and all of our computers have been uh, uh, seized and locked and encrypted so no documents that were on those uh, are available for our use unless we pay some ransom to some foreign entity uh, to release them. And even at the, the, the cost of paying that, you may or may not get that. The city of Atlanta was hit recently, and it cost millions of dollars. The uh, city of Miami was, was uh, hit. I don't know why we uh, were on the radar screen of anybody, uh, but it, certainly for a small church and academy like ourselves, it, uh, it, it's locked up decades worth of uh, documents that we have. Now, here's the good thing, all right? So, uh, in the, the encrypting of our uh, computers and our documents, there is nothing uh, with personal information or financial information that has been seized or, 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 or taken or compromised. Our banks have confirmed that. Our website has confirmed that. All of that is hel held offline uh, somewhere, so which is good. It's off-site. Uh, but anyway, it's going to be a hassle for the next several uh, weeks, perhaps months, to try to recreate things that we use around here for our academy and for our church. So I pray that you'll be patient with us. Uh, with that, we're going to have to replace uh, a lot of stuff, both uh, you know, hardware, uh, software, and, um, and documents. So you can see it's a challenge. But these are just part of the schemes of the devil to keep us from doing what we're doing. And apparently we must be doing something right because he's not pleased and he's allowing uh, uh, you know, to get in different ways. Listen, church existed before computers. The gospel is still clear in here, you know. Uh, some of you laugh because you're like, you still exist, you know, with now the computer. So I, I understand that. Um, but um, anyway, it's just a challenge. And just, you know, it's, it's taking a, a beating on our budget, uh, quite frankly. And so I just pray that, you know, that uh, if you'll pray about that, perhaps you'll be able to assist in, in some ways. And I'm going to send out an email to, to uh, church-wide and, and school-wide just so they're aware of what's taking place and what's going to have to do, uh, be taken care of. I'm just thankful that this week, uh, as the staff has to deal with all this, I get to go on a mission trip with the teenagers for six days and not have to me mess with any of that. You know, and I'll come back and Donna will have it all fixed. Uh, love Donna, Danny, Kristen, Amanda, you know, all of them. Anyway, well, um, I know it's a little awkward to start a message that way. Uh, you ever had a, a times where there's awkward conversations? Yeah. H have you ever been in the store and somebody's walking around and they say, hey, how's it going? And you turn around and say, I'm doing pretty good. And you realize they're not talking to you, they're on, talking on their phone through their Bluetooth. And then you're kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Have you ever walked up to an old friend you haven't seen in a long time, you see them in a restaurant, you walk over, hey, how you doing? And then you find out that really wasn't them. It just looked like your old friend. Have you ever walked up to a lady and said, hey, when are you due? And you find out she's not pregnant? Those are some awkward conversations and moments. And you don't, you know, you just want to, it used to be, what was it, uh, Southwest Airlines used to have the commercial, you want to get away? <laughs> you know, yes, at those times you want to get away. Well, if you ever want to get into an awkward conversation, you know, intentionally, just talk about politics in an open forum, talk about religion, or more specifically, talk about the exclusivity of Christ, that he is the only way, truth, and life, the only way to the Father. And those who don't follow him go to hell for eternity. Conversation over. But that's the reality of things. There are times that we have to engage in conversations that may feel a little awkward, out of place. But Jesus wasn't afraid to talk about the reality of where people are headed if they don't follow him. So who's your one? Who's your one that's headed towards a Christless eternity? I want to read just briefly on this. Last week I had mentioned um, some excuses that we give uh, on, on not sharing the gospel, and, and one of those is that uh, there's a, a decreasing belief in a literal hell. You know, more and more people, uh, certainly in the world and, and even uh, those within the church, uh, are, are backing away from from hell. I just want to read you a portion of John MacArthur's commentary on this where he quotes a few people as well. He says, No one who takes the Bible seriously doubts the existence of heaven. Almost the whole country believes in heaven. But hell is denied by many and even preached by few. Many who profess to believe in the authority of Scripture avoid speaking about hell. They express doubts that more uh, than any more than a few colossal sinners will actually go there or even deny its existence altogether in direct contradiction to the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said uh, more about hell than anyone else and solemnly affirmed its existence as the eternal place of eternal conscious torment for most people. Robert Thomas summarizes the Lord's teaching on hell this way. He says, Throughout his ministry, Jesus taught that the lost would depart into an eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels in eternal punishment. In other words, they will suffer endless conscious agony away from the presence of God in his Son. None of the other options that confuse the evangelical spectrum are viable in light of these views of eternal punishment. John MacArthur writes again, some think that the idea of hell is cruel, unkind, unfair. What kind of God, they ask, would send people into everlasting punishment? But God is never in the position of defending himself regarding the truths that he has revealed in Scripture. His nature, works, and revelation define what is true, just, and righteous. The purpose of the divine revelation of hell's horror is to warn sinners of its reality and the terrifying fate that awaits them there so as to motivate them to repent of their sins and embrace salvation in Christ. The biblical revelation regarding hell should motivate believers to defend the clear teaching of our Lord and the rest of Scripture. It should also infuse them with the sense of urgency in evangelizing the lost. Quoting from Richard Mayhew, Neither a cavalier attitude towards the lost nor a compassionate compromise are appropriate for, su uh, for a subject such of grave import. MacArthur once again. To warn sinners of the fearful fate that awaits them is an act of sympathy and compassion. But in its zeal to find pragmatic new methods of evangelism, the church has too often abandoned this message. That message must include the bad news of what happens to those who will reject the good news of the gospel. 
The tragic truth is that most people who end up in hell will be shocked to find themselves there. A recent survey revealed that virtually all people who believe in heaven also believe that they will be there. Such was the case of the rich man and Lazarus' story. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. If you're using the red Bible in the pew rack right in front of you, you can turn to page 876. Looking back in, in my sermon files, I can't recall or have not found, well, they're all encrypted, so what does it matter? Um, I can't recall the last time I actually preached a sermon on hell. I do recall one time uh, another pastor that I sat under his preaching preached an entire sermon on hell, uh, very impactful. I know most people outside of the church say, that's all I ever preach on is hell. Well, unfortunately, that's not what we preach on all the time, but certainly it's worthy of our attention. In Luke chapter 16, let me start in verse 19 and, and read through verse 31, and then kind of uh, read the context, and then we'll go back through it. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who was feasting uh, uh, sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus, that that poor man at his side and he called out father Abraham have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame but Abraham said child remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things but now he is comforted here And you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass here from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, and that he may warn them lest they also come into a place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Now I want you to consider for a moment. How did a man in hell know that in order not to go to hell, you must repent? There is good theology in hell. Look at verse 31. The answer to him, he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Listen, if, if you had a friend die who didn't know Jesus and went to hell, and then Jesus was gracious enough to release them to come back and to preach to you or your friends, the Bible says that you're not going to be any more convinced if you won't believe the Scriptures outright. You're not going to have any more impact unless the Spirit of God does something intentionally in the heart of man, which is needed. We are all looking for miracles, and this would be one. And, and in this parable... It says that if they're not going to believe the Bible, Moses and the prophets, neither are they going to believe the one who rises from the dead. <sighs> you know, it takes a work of the Holy Spirit, and that's what I'm praying for us. Now, this morning, perhaps you're, you'll be listening to this going, yes, there are people who need to hear this message. I'll pray for them. And, and I always 
uh, am praying before the service, if there was someone here who hasn't truly trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, hasn't understood that Jesus came and died on the cross and rose from the grave so that men and women, boys and girls, can be saved and have an eternal life, if you haven't really received that, I pray that today you would. But that's not my primary focus this morning, though that's certainly something I desire to happen. My primary focus is to awaken the believers of the reality of hell, which you may have forgotten about, and that your friends and your family members are going there, and it is essential that we, through the proclamation of the gospel, see people saved by the power of the Spirit. We get very callous and casual in our Christianity, and we talk about who's your one in evangelism, and go, all right, well, we'll pray just, it, there, there might be a time in our future. Listen, people are headed to a Christless eternity. And the reality is, God did not create hell for man. He created it for Satan and his angels, as we've read. But for those who will reject the loving, gracious, sovereign Savior, that's where they end up. And so, how is it we're released? By hearing the gospel, receiving it, repenting of our sins. Not our works but trusting in the works of Christ. It transforms hearts and lives. So why would we keep the good news within ourselves when those who need it so desperately are dying and going to hell? It is not compassionate to withhold. It is loving and sympathetic when we plead with somebody. If you knew the cure to cancer, you wouldn't withhold it from your family members. You'd say, you've got to have this. This will cure you. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone will accept it. Everyone will just embrace you. Some will, will, will think you're crazy. You, you realize when Jesus was, was, was sharing uh, the gospel, when he was uh, healing people, his very siblings rejected him. They lived with him. You know, they were bunkmates, you know, the, his brothers, and, and, and they, none of them followed Jesus while he was living. Not until after the death of the resurrection did his brothers go, oh, he really is God. They just thought he was the perfect child before them, and they were a little jealous, perhaps. Mama's favorite. Listen, the reality is every one of us need a Savior. Every one of us need the gospel. And so I want us to go back through this, this passage for a moment. Thinking about hell, I'm getting real dry in my mouth. So I got my water, Marie, thank you. It's not a fancy bottle, but it'll work. We're living at a time when most do not like to hear what I'm sharing today. There's a diminishing belief in hell. But let me ask you a question. If Jesus is not going to allow those in hell to come back to warn people, who will warn people? Who will let them know that hell is a reality and it's not a place anyone desires to be? If you were to read through the 27 books of the New Testament, you'd realize Jesus talked about hell three times more than he talked about heaven. And heaven certainly is a place we all desire to go. And it's by his grace that we can receive that and go there. But he emphasized hell as a warning. Did you know that hell was not created as a place for you, as I mentioned? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, John 3, 17 says, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's his desire. And rather than just as he's preparing hell for Satan and his angels, you know what God is preparing for those who will follow him? As John chapter 14 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you up to myself. And there you will be with me also. Jesus is preparing a place for us, for those who will desire to just trust him and follow him. It's a good word. Richard Baxter, a Puritan pastor of another 
generation lived in a perspective of both heaven and hell and he directed his church members on uh, uh, the document uh, discovered how to spend the day with God I want you to listen to what Richard Baxter wrote for his church members let God have your first awakening thoughts lift up your hearts to him reverently and thankfully for the rest enjoyed uh, for the rest enjoyed the night before and cast upon you him for the day which follows familiarize yourself so consistently to this that your conscience may check you when common thoughts shall first intrude think of the mercy of a night's rest and how many that have spent that night in hell how many in prison how many in cold hard lodgings how many suffering from agonizing pains and sickness weary of their beds and of their lives think of how many souls that were that night called from their bodies terrifyingly to appear before God and think how quickly days and nights are rolling on how speedily your last night and day will come observe that which is lacking in the preparedness of your soul for such a time and seek it without delay let me give you a few thoughts on hell and then we're gonna walk through this passage number one hell is eternal you know every person who's ever been born is still alive today some are living here some are living in heaven and some are living in hell there is no ceasing to exist at death we're just going to be living somewhere else everyone is living somewhere and eternity is too long to be wrong so the question is do you know Christ and do those you know know Christ are you saved some of you may think, well, I hope so. I think so. I'm counting on it. Listen, you ought to know so. And you can know so. John writes in 1 John chapter 5, I write these things so that you may believe in the name of the Son of God and that you may know that you have eternal life. And, and if you want to know how to have eternal life, uh, allow me some time to just spend with you or somebody near you that knows the, the, the Christ that we proclaim. Hell is eternal. It's forever. The second thing I want you to know is that hell is a place of pain. The Bible refers to hell as a place of torment. Jesus actually said in Mark uh, chapter 9, verse 44, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. He said in Luke chapter 13, verse 28, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It does not sound like a place I want to be. The third thing I want you to know is that hell is a place of fear. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, and if anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, well, who's written in the book of life? Those who follow Christ, those who have been redeemed by the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ himself. But if your name is not written in that book of life, he is they are thrown into the lake of fire. The language there is intentional. God chose the language because it's the reality and he wants you to know that's not a place that we ought to embrace or desire hell is a place of sadness some of you have read uh, Dante's Divine Comedy anybody here a few you should it's <sighs> describing the journey of going through hell on his way to heaven in the, in the section called Inferno, he described the sign above the portals of hell. This is what it says. Abandon hope, all who enter here. Because there is no joy or peace or hope in hell. It's a place of sadness. And the last thing, hell is a place of isolation. Coming up on my 30-year high school reunion, I don't think I'll be attending but it's good to connect with some people hence that's why I, uh, I posted a picture recently of of my graduation picture and then one of today and I don't see a difference but some of you did um, 
But I remember uh, it, even there, and, and I went back and I looked at some of my yearbooks, and I'm thankful that, uh, that God got a hold of me early on, and I was able to share the gospel several times in, in my class. And, and, uh, and, and one person in the book yearbook called me a Jesus freak, and another person says, you, you actually inspired me. I've been quiet about my faith. You know, a lot of those type of things. And other people just cuss and all kinds of stuff in my yearbook. But anyway, it's there. But I remember conversation with certain people that I would share, and they say, you know, I say, well, aren't you concerned? You know, you might go to hell. And they go, yeah, I'm going to hell and all my friends are going to be with me. And I thought, you know, you really don't have an understanding about how, what hell is like. Hell is a place of isolation. There's not one place in Scripture that ever says that people are hanging out in hell together. There may be millions in hell, but you are alone. No fellowship. No connection. Which can be incredibly sad so lonely. That would be hell, wouldn't it? This is a reality that, that uh, some may disagree with me here, so you'll just have to do your own theological study and debate me if you want to do that. Uh, but about the isolation, I've heard people say that God, it's the one place God is not. And I don't believe that. I believe God is an omnipresent God, meaning He is everywhere. He is not limited where He is. And, and when I read the psalmist who says in Psalm uh, 139, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. And if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Now let me tell you the reality of God and, I, and my theological position on this. I believe God is everywhere, in heaven and in hell, but He is not the same type of God in both places. There is a loving Father, the Sovereign One, the One who cares and, and keeps and protects, and there's a God of wrath who is very present in hell and unrelenting. So yes, you will feel isolated because there's none of your own friends hanging out with you. But God is there, but not the comforting God you seek and desire. So let me, let me walk through this passage in the, in the time we've got left. Because there are a few good things in hell. Have you ever considered that? This passage alone teaches me there are some good things in hell. Number one, there are good people in hell. This man who was in hell, this rich man, you know, uh, how good was he? I don't know, but morally... He seemed, okay, he has a heart to care for people. He calls out for his brothers to be saved. He cares. There, there's a heart, there's a caring individual, but he's in hell. Why? Because he did not follow the Lord Jesus Christ nor repent of his sins. He, and I understand we would say that uh, uh, any part, uh, anybody apart from God is not good. All of us are not good. I understand that uh, spiritually we're not good. But you know good people. You know, there are people who pay their taxes and they're just good neighbors. It doesn't mean they know Jesus. They're just a, a good, moral people. And that's the very people that sometimes are confused when they don't necessarily follow a God, they don't necessarily trust Jesus Christ, but I'm a good person, as if the, my good outweighed my bad, therefore I deserve heaven. Reality is, Christ is the only way to heaven, trusting in Him alone. And good people can be in hell. There's good vision in hell, which is very interesting. In verse 23 of, of Luke 16, And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes, and he saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. It's amazing how clearly he could see what he was missing. You know, there are good prayers in hell. Look at verse 24. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Abraham being the representative in heaven for God in this parable. And send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish in this flame. Good prayers. Had he merely prayed that prior to death, had he merely looked up to God and said, God, as a sinner, I don't deserve anything of you. You, you could pass me by and it would be completely righteous, but would you... Have mercy on me, a sinner, needing your saving grace. Not like the other story, we see another parable in the Scripture where there was a, a, a lowly sinner who was praying for mercy, and the other uh, Pharisee was saying, well, uh, thank you that you didn't make me like that sinner. Not recognizing his own sin. There are those who say, I have never sinned, I, I'm a good person, I've done enough. But boy, in hell, 
it appears that this individual, this rich man, understood how to pray. Unfortunately, it was too late, and this prayer would not be answered. There's a good memory in hell. Whether that's a good thing for him or not. It says in verse 25, For Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. He had his best life now. But Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. You know, he would spend eternity in hell remembering everything that took place and all that he accumulated, and it just wasn't enough. And perhaps he would remember every person who shared with him the way to God, and he rejected them. There's good theology in hell. I've already mentioned that uh, in my opening statement. But I believe, truly, there are zero atheists in hell. Every atheist will be converted to believing there is a God. It says in verse 26, And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from here, uh, from there to us. You know, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 11, it says, And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Some will do it in this life, and some will do it in the next. Here's the good theology in hell. This man is not asleep in hell. There is no such thing as this soul sleep. You're unaffected or unaware of what's taking place. Neither is this man ceasing to exist as some will say well 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 hell is just the, uh, the, the just ceasing to exist you will disappear you'll no longer be there'll be people in heaven and then nobody else this man is very much alive and aware of what's taking place hell is a very real place this was a teaching of jesus if we're going to uh, trust him as a good teacher and ultimately, as the sovereign Savior, we have to understand what he's teaching in this word, which is true. Hell is real, and all people will know it. The last thing, I, well, no, two more things. One is that good priorities are in hell. While this rich man is in hell, he has the right priorities. He says then, if, he, if he's not able to be satisfied, he can't even get a, a, a drop of water. It says in verse 27, and he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into the place of torment. Warn them. Witness. That they may be witness to. Warning them, lest they also come. This man in hell has no desire for those brothers to experience the same. That's a good priority. If there's nothing that can be done for me, I care enough. My top priority is for those I love that they would not experience the same. Wow. He didn't experience salvation, but he desires for his brothers to be saved. I wonder if either his father is dead or his father's still alive but follows but his brothers still do not. I wonder if, that, if we, as followers of Christ, if you are one, do you care more about your family than this man who's in hell cares about his at this point? Certainly we should not care less. He cares about his brothers. He does not desire for them to go. Can you just tell him the truth? Which leads me to the last point today. There are good intentions in hell. You know, one can reject Christ through outright rebellion, but rejection of the Lord does not have to be so active. I mean, rarely do you meet someone who says, yes, I completely reject the idea of God, and, and I desire to go to hell. What I hear most is, yes, I know I need God. Someday, I'll follow. Someday, I'll turn my life over. Someday I'll slow down and focus on him. I know several, uh, well, 
so far I've, I've seen 22 people in my graduating class that are already gone. A few of them I knew uh, very personally and, and some of them not so much. But I know that some of them would say, one day, and that day never came because they were gone before it was too late. I remember in high school, I, I told you about a gang member that uh, uh, was shot shortly after I sh shared Christ with him. There was another individual, uh, his name was Kyle. Young man, one night he called me, uh, you know, and I, I went and picked him up when I was helping him. Um, and, uh, and just began to, to share Christ with him. He came to church with us a few times. He had a real bad home situation. Um, but he gave his life to Christ. And I don't remember how long much later it was. I believe I'd already gone to college at that time. I remember Mike sent me the news um, through the newspaper. Uh, Kyle was driving a car with a friend or something. I vaguely remember the details other than uh, he was out in the, 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 out in the desert in Las Vegas and, uh, and lost control of his vehicle and smashed into one of the, uh, the mountains and died. It wasn't very long between the time he started following and the time he died. And I'm thankful for the moments that we spent together. I'm thankful that I was able to go get him one night when he was kicked out of his home at 1, 2 a.m. And, uh, and that was before cell phones. I don't remember how he got a hold of me. But anyway, I was able to, to get to him and kind of let him sleep at our house and, and just kind of take care of him for a little while and, and tell him about a loving father when he had no loving father and his mother was, was kind of messed up as well. I'm just thankful that his time was coming to an end and nobody knew it, but he received Jesus before that time. But how many have rejected or how many have never heard the message because you haven't shared it? And their end came way before it was on their schedule. Hell is full of people who intended to go to heaven. Hell wasn't prepared for us. No, there's a place being prepared for those who follow Jesus. Hell was prepared for for Satan and his angels. But for those who reject, I, uh, I can't recall who, who said it uh, many years ago, but he said, for those who say, thy will be done, God will work his will and bring you to heaven. But for those who reject, God will just say to them, then thy will be done, and they'll be separated forever. What we have to do is repent of our sins, acknowledge that we are sinners, that our sin deserves hell, but Jesus died for us, paying the penalty for our sins, putting our faith in him, allows us to receive full forgiveness. Who is it in your life, in your family, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, at your grocery store, that just needs to have a genuine, heartfelt conversation about the gospel. Last week, some of you confirmed with me that you're going to take the challenge to take someone to breakfast or lunch or dinner and just share your story and bring the gospel into it. Some of you said that you'd even have a family over to your home from your neighborhood and just so you would share. And as, as awkward as you may think that is, I tell you there's nothing more loving than just telling who you are. Listen, this month... There are a lot of people out marching, parading around, sharing who they are. They're not ashamed of who they are. Well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel and who Jesus is. And I want to share that because it'll have eternal consequences for their soul. That's what we talk about when we say, who's your one? Share the gospel with others because people need the Lord. And you know the way. Would you pray with me as our ushers get prepared to receive our offering? Father, you are a gracious God, but you're a truth-giving God. You're a God who doesn't withhold uh, the reality of things. That we stand between heaven and hell, and Christ is the only way. For the wages of sin is death, eternal death, separation from a loving God. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus when he is our Lord. I pray for anybody listening today, uh, either in this room or, or watching online, 
uh, even after today, as they may watch a, a YouTube video clip of this, that they, if they're not a believer, if they haven't truly turned their heart over to Christ, that they would do so. Only your spirit can do that in them, and I pray that you would do a, uh, your sharpening work, replacing the heart of stone with the heart of flesh and giving them the Holy Spirit. But for believers in this room and also listening online, that you would convict them by your spirit, reminding them of the realities that hell is real, heaven is desired, but repentance and faith in Jesus is the key that unlocks that opportunity. Spirit, you do your work, and may your church thrive as we proclaim your name. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you that you're here today. Our ushers will be coming by and receiving your offering. While they're doing so, let me just mention a few things here. Uh, we do have some growth groups in just a few moments. Love for you to be a part of that. And, and uh, if you're new with us, I'd love to get a chance to meet you. Uh, I'll be out in the lobby in just a little bit, so please come interact. Um, we are a member-supported church, and we appreciate your generous donations. Everything that we get to do uh, is because of your faithful contributions. So if uh, uh, today I want us to recognize uh, our uh, mission team that will be going out this week. If you're part of the uh, Infuge mission team, I know not everybody's in town today. There's Some of them are coming back this afternoon, but we leave out in the morning. Would you come, uh, our 6th through 12th graders, come down here with me for a moment because I'm going to have Jim Jennings, one of our elders, pray over us. Uh, let me get a, a microphone. But I just wanted you to be able to, to see some faces of people that will be going to North Greenville University, staying on their campus, but then reaching the, the larger Greenville area uh, through gospel presentations, through uh, uh, vacation Bible school opportunities through uh, care centers uh, through various uh, means when we get there there'll be about 900 other students from all over the southeast and so uh, how about you guys get a little closer and make it easier for Jim but these this is your mission team with a few others that aren't here today so and I'll be going as well and uh, and I love that uh, it is the 610 goes back to that Ephesians passage I was reading earlier about the schemes of the devil it is preceded by verse six, uh, chapter 6, verse 10, where it says, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. These students minister, and we uh, share the gospel in the strength of God, not in our own strength. So that's why we go to the Lord in prayer today. Would you pray for us, Jim? Father, first and foremost, we want to thank you for Jesus. We want to thank you for your word, Father, that we can read and study and apply it to our lives and Father, we certainly thank you for these youth. We pray that you would be with them, that they would have a great week. We pray for your protection. We pray that if any of them need to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life, that they'll do that this week. And Father, we just uh, pray that you'd be with us, be with Chris and the other counselors. Uh, give them words of wisdom. And... Uh, we just love you, and we just lift these young people up to you, Father, for a safe, safe journey, safe travel, and a great, great week of growth in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, as the band sings our closing song, why don't you stand up and greet with one another and invite somebody to your growth group. God bless you. You're dismissed.